living in a transformative society or transformative societies, uh, things are changing. They're changing everywhere, you know. When we look at our sciences, the sciences today are dominated or increasingly influenced, let's put it this way, by interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary activities. I myself come out of an institute for environmental sciences where we have tried over the last years to integrate social sciences, all of the social sciences with natural sciences and environmental medicine. And it, it's possible, it works. Even if you have a physicist and chemist once in a while who says, why should I talk to a sociologist? It's worthwhile to do it. <laughs> Alison is laughing here. <laughs> so, we have three speakers this afternoon, each of which is uh, his own, has his own mark. We will start our presentation with Mauricio Lopez, president, president of Emprapa, ex-president of Emprapa. Uh, Emprapa, who does not know what Emprapa is, is one of the largest agricultural agricultural oriented research organizations with an enormous impact of what happens in agriculture in Brazil. He will report on food security in, in Brazil, the developments, and we will we look, so to speak, from the top down on water and other resources. Then we will have a talk moving over to Africa from uh, Canisius Cananicre, who is a executive secretary of the Council, of the African Minister's Council for Water, the African Union. Very important, I'm very privileged, I feel we are very privileged to have you here because the political decisions which have to be made on water in Africa are enormous. And the more we can transmit our scientific knowledge to the politi political level, the better it is. And last but not least, we have Maj 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 Zalewski who is an eco-hydrologist and is director of the European Regional Center for Eco-Hydrology, which is a UNESCO center in Wuch in Poland. Uh, those of you which are looking at eco-hydrology have seen his name over and over again. I had the privilege of visiting him several times and I learned a lot from his institution. I was deeply impressed how far they go in the ecological considerations. Again, it's an interdisciplinary approach to things. So. Now, I didn't ask them to come up here. So you should at least stand up so we see you. <laughs> that is the after lunch effect. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> so, Mauricio, you are on and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to start uh, thanking the Academy for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. And I think it's my job also to help keep you awake after that uh, nice uh, lunch uh, that we had. As Peter said, I'm going to talk about food, food security. Uh, and I'm placing the emphasis of my talk in what I call the tropical belt of the world. So my presentation connects to the theme of this session on food security, access and use of natural resources and obviously sustainable development. I will use the experience of Brazil as a reference, uh, a, a reference we think it's a good one for seeking uh, food security in uh, the tropical world. Why it's important to talk about the tro tropical belt? Unfortunately, it's in the tropical belt that we have most of the, of the food insecure countries in the world. We have the most serious problems with uh, inequality and poverty uh, and uh, a region where it's quite difficult uh, to farm. It's, it's very tough to farm in the tropics for obvious reasons. We have very intense uh, environmental situations that will get intenser. We uh, are uh, already seeing an intensification of stresses of all sorts, uh, biotic, abiotic, uh, extreme events happening all over the world, but more intensely in 
the tropics. It will pose even more challenges for food security in uh, the future. Somebody yesterday was praising uh, the extension of our soils, how fertile they are. I think it was the, 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 the golden dragon. Where is the golden dragon? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> But in fact, uh, we have the poorest uh, soils on Earth. Tropical soils are very poor. They've been washed out for millennia. So they are very poor in nutrients. They are very acidic, rich in aluminum. So this is a major uh, challenge for agriculture and, and, and farming in, in the tropics. And also, the tropical belt of the world holds the, the richest diversity, biological diversity on Earth. This is good, <clears throat> this is fantastic to have this richness, but it also poses quite a lot of challenges. How to balance uh, the needs of using and accessing uh, uh, the natural resource base without putting this uh, rich uh, diversity uh, in risk. This is also a big uh, challenge uh, now and a big challenge in the future. Uh, Brazil, uh, until the 70s, uh, didn't know how to deal with this situation. Being a country which is uh, about a continent, we are the fifth largest country in the world, but uh, until the 70s, Brazil was not a food secure country. We were basically producers and exporters of coffee and sugar, and we imported a lot of different uh, products. But then uh, we took a decision there back in the 70s, to create a model of agriculture that uh, could be more, uh, that could fit the reality of the tropics. Because until then, we tried to copy science and technology from other places that didn't fit the reality, couldn't handle uh, the challenges that we have here in the tropical uh, uh, Brazil. So in, in only 40 years, uh, due to this combination of public policies, very strong decisions, building institutions, Brazil was able to reach its food security and beyond that to become also an important provider of agricultural products uh, to the world. I summarize this path of the past 40, 50 years in four different steps. We had the first moment which was applying science and knowledge to expand our agriculture. Then we moved into gaining competitivity. With the first one, we gained our food security. With the second one, we became uh, important uh, competitors, exporters. But then we had to move into uh, this agenda of sustainability because of all the drawbacks and all the limitations of the models that we took before. And now we are entering this uh, big challenge of uh, taking advantage of the multifunctional uh, nature of agriculture. Agriculture is one of the most multifunctional uh, activities of, that humans have uh, developed. Uh, in the 70s uh, and the 80s and 90s, our agriculture moved very fast uh, to the central part of Brazil, to the, to, to the savanna, to the Cerrado. This was basically due to this uh, very strong and robust system of uh, science, technology, and education that Brazil uh, developed. My organization, Embrapa, was created in the 70s. We reinforced our universities. Brazil has excellent agricultural universities, also state research institutes, and more recently, a lot of emphasis of uh, the private sector in agricultural innovation. I summarize what we've done in this first uh, step with this slide. I think we've done very important three things. We've been able to understand and to transform our acidic and poor soils into fertile land. We've been able to tropicalize crops and animal production systems that were not adapted to our tropical reality. And also we've been uh, able to develop a platform of sustainable practices in zoning of agricultural risks, manage risks in a more efficient way. I think these three things made a lot of difference for us. You see here natural soils with soybeans and soils with a fertility built, a big uh, difference. We also learned to deal with nutrition of plants in the tropics, which is very tricky 
Phosphorus nutrition is a very tricky thing in tropical soils, in oxy soils. We've, we've been able to deal with that. Also using uh, creative ways to uh, uh, reduce costs, like nitrogen fixation in soybeans. Today, Brazil uses a technology uh, which is based in a bacteria, Rhizobia, which is inoculated in uh, the seeds. Brazil plants 13, 5, uh, 35 million hectares of soybeans every year, and we do not use one gram of uh, uh, fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, nitrogen. So it means $13 billion uh, saving, uh, savings for the country and the farmers every year. And also we, reduce, we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, due to that 62 million tons of CO2 equivalent every year that we save, that we do not uh, put into uh, the atmosphere. Also other practices like no-till uh, systems, which is tremendously disseminated all over the country today. Uh, breeding for adapting crops to the tropics, like soybeans here. You see where soybeans were in the 60s, and then it moved quickly in the 70s, in the 90s, and today soybeans are grown all over Brazil, all over the tropical world, due to our effort in genetics and breeding and adaptation of this crop to the tropical reality. We've done the same with uh, corn. <coughs> And now we are moving fast to tropicalize uh, wheat, as you can see here in this graph. Wheat is gradually moving also to the central part of Brazil. Very tough uh, to tropicalize wheat, which is a typically uh, temperate uh, crop. This is very important. Not many people, even, even in Brazil, know about this. Uh, Brazil has one of the most sophisticated strategies for risk management in agriculture. This is very mature. Over 20 years we've been using this. Embrapa developed this system and we have Brazil totally zoned for over 40 different crops. We know exactly where, what is the best time to plant and with what the kind of technologies that farmers uh, should plant. This had a tremendous impact on the way that agriculture expanded in Brazil in a much more secure and sustainable way. <clears throat> and the big impact is here of all this. The cost of food, if we compare the cost of food in Brazil in, in the mid-70s to today, it's cut by half. So it was a tremendous impact on the lives, especially of poor people that spend most of their money buying food. You see a very steep decrease in the cost of food in the country. And this was the biggest uh, contribution of uh, agriculture innovation. Also, uh, Brazil became capable of producing much more than uh, it needed. Uh, today, Brazil produces five times what is needed for its population. Uh, we are able to feed about one billion people around the world. Uh, Brazil exports to over 220 countries around uh, the globe. So we gained uh, competitivity. As you can see here in this graph, we have uh, in green what uh, remains here, in blue what goes to different markets around the world of a few selected uh, commodities. So with this, uh, Brazil became food secure, but also gained the position of an important uh, provider of food and agricultural products uh, to the world. And uh, we can see this, uh, this is from nature and from the economist. Obviously, it all has its costs. There is no agriculture without impact. And we know everything about uh, the Amazon and the outcry related to the sustainability and the problems of deforestation and all that. So we are very aware of it. And Brazil, a few years back, he started looking very carefully at how to bring knowledge and new technologies to make our agricultural systems more uh, in line or more in sync with the concept of uh, sustainability. Also this nexus, water, energy, nature, food, the competitive uh, uh, use of resources like water. We need water for the cities, we need water for energy, we need water for, uh, for biodiversity, we need water uh, for many things. So how to deal with this competitive uh, nature of accessing and using uh, resources. 
That's why Brazil is investing more and more uh, in, the, in a concept of a sustainable, intensified agriculture to remove the pressure on uh, important, our important uh, natural resource bases. I'll give you two examples of very concrete things that Brazil is doing to move its agriculture towards a, a, a con concept of a sustainable agriculture. These uh, two policies, the Forestry Code and the Low Carbon Agricultural Plan, which are in place. The Forestry Code is a law that was approved in Brazil in 2012. It is a very bold plan. It's something very unique. Uh, as far as I know, no other country around the world has such a, a policy. So what we want with that is to limit the expansion of agricultural land, conserve water and biodiversity in private land, not in public land, in private land. So basically this law enforces conservation of the water sources and protection of biodiversity within private properties. It's a unique case in the world. So uh, if you have a stream going through your property, you have by law to protect the, 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 the banks of this stream. All uh, water sources are protected by this law and this protection is enforced uh, obviously by law. If you are in, in the Amazon, you are, by this law, forced to conserve 80% of your land as native, as natural forest. If you are in the Cerrado or in other areas, it's less. But it's a law that is protecting these two very important things, biodiversity, our natural forests, and uh, the water sources. How we have more than 5 million properties in Brazil. All of them are traced. All of them have a polygon, which is identified by satellite. And this is part of this, uh, uh, what we call uh, a registry, rural environmental registry. So all farms in Brazil are known, the area that they have, the area that they conserve, and how they are treating uh, the natural resources there. And uh, if you go, if you fly over Brazil, you will find uh, this kind of uh, landscape. Uh, we have corridors for biodiversity to move around among uh, the crops. I think we are doing quite well uh, with uh, this uh, new legislation. More than 20% of Brazil now is conserved as natural resources within the private land. If we add uh, Nat national parks and uh, indigenous land and all other protected uh, lands in Brazil, we have 66.3% of the country which is protected, which, is, uh, which has natural uh, forests on them. It's equivalent to 48 countries in Europe, like you can see here. So with this, I think uh, it's just to make the point that Brazil is doing its best uh, to, to really... Uh, face the challenge of moving its agriculture towards a uh, concept of uh, sustainable agriculture. The other very important program is the Low Carbon Agricultural Plan. The idea is to lower greenhouse gas emission in rural areas through agriculture. So basically this uh, law, this legislation, this public uh, policy uh, uh, creates the condition for the spread of technologies to help us, for instance, to, uh, 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 to recover degraded pastures. Brazil has about 50 million hectares of degraded pastures. This could be the next agricultural frontier in Brazil. Instead of cutting forests, we can recover this land and have our crops expanding here instead of uh, uh, destroying uh, natural environments. Also, double cropping. There is a clear tendency in Brazil for what we call sustainable intensification, doing double cropping, like here, uh, harvesting soybeans. At the same time, the planters are coming behind and planting corn immediately after harvesting soybeans. So we have two crops instead of one. So it also saves, saves lands and saves uh, save pressure over land. And now we are moving into this concept of combining crop, livestock, crop, livestock, forestry, as you can see in these uh, slides. This is becoming part of the agricultural landscape in Brazil. Uh, forestry com combined with pastures, forestry combined with crops, 
So this is uh, uh, gaining a lot of space in Brazil. This is a way to produce uh, low carbon or zero carbon beef, for instance, because you can offset the emissions from cattle by having uh, trees uh, within your pastures. So uh, we have about uh, 15 million hectares of these uh, combining systems in Brazil, and they are growing uh, very, very uh, fast. So this is the result of this public policy, the low carbon agricultural plan. And now we have this opportunity to move into this new dimension that I call the multifunctional dimension of agriculture. Again, agriculture is one of the most multifunctional uh, activities that humans have uh, developed. And it uh, dialogues quite well with basically all uh, 17 uh, development uh, goals. FAO, in fact, uh, describes quite well how agriculture and rural areas dialogue with each one of the 17 SDGs. And we can use agriculture to drive the agenda for uh, SDGs uh, implementation. Agriculture can be a source of food, fiber, and then energy, but also can help us bridge this gap between food, nutrition, and health. Agriculture can be a provider of environmental and ecosystem services, can be a source of biomass to substitute, for instance, in, in, the, in the chemistry industry, non-renewable resources like petroleum. Or uh, the organic, agroecology, agroforestry, there are so many di in interesting dimensions emerging that can take advantage of this multifunctional nature of agriculture to help uh, the world reach uh, 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 sustainable development. I, I like very much the, the last one. I, I, I don't have time to tell you about the other ones. But I like very much this uh, concept of linking food, culture, tradition, gastronomy with uh, the industry that grows the most in the world, which is the tourism. So there is a growing opportunity for countries like Brazil and many other countries around the world with a huge diversity, a rich culture, with beautiful landscapes like we have in our country. Uh, to uh, value this concept of food as experience. People want uh, new flavors, new tastes, new te textures, new sensations. This is a fantastic opportunity for small uh, farmers uh, to value their culture, their way of doing things, different species, different fruits, different tastes, different kinds of fruits, to dialogue with this huge move movement that is going around the world, which is the gastronomic uh, movement, and also to connect with this uh, very important industry, which is uh, the tourist, uh, tourism uh, industry. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I think it's, it's this. I think Brazil... Uh, despite of its sheer size, the complexity of its natural resources, uh, this big challenge of being an important agricultural nation, an important producer and exporter. The world is always asking us if we are going to reinforce our capacity to export, to provide to the world. I think this is an opportunity for us as long as we do it carefully, as long as we do it in, in, in an intelligent way. So I think we have learned quite a bit to reach uh, 2030 with a situation much better than we have today, and also to have hope to help uh, the world face the challenges in the horizon of 2050. My last slides, I think uh, we have to be propositive here. I think that uh, Brazil can help the world face the challenges ahead, which are not small, or which are very complex. We can enhance our capacity as a food producer and supplier. I think many countries will be in need of the food that is produced in this country. Consolidating capacity in conservation, agriculture, and sustainable intensification. This is a concept that I think it came to stay, sustainable intensification. Intensify the use of the land in an intelligent way to relieve the pressure over our forests. We want to keep the Amazon as it is. We want to keep part of the Cerrado as it is. And sharing knowledge and experience in tropical agricultural systems. Brazil is quite open to share this knowledge and this experience with uh, the world. Thank you so much for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here.
Did I promise too much? <laughs> One has to stay awake. Now follows the Executive Secretary of the, minister, the Ministers for War in Africa. And we look forward to your presentation on what Africa has to offer for the future and where its path is going to go. It will be very important for the development of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, hmm. Did you take something from here? Or you need to push? You need to push right, left? Thank you. Oop. I think before I go to my own presentation, I will first congratulate my uh, colleague uh, who made a very good presentation. I remember in my other life when I was dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, I would certainly have taken this opportunity and bring my faculty and some other people to come and learn from here. But um, nevertheless, I think I will uh, create the interests of my colleague of the Rwanda Agricultural Board to come and see your successes and learn a bit from this. Uh, it, it was fantastic. I will try to keep you awake. After his presentation, it will be very challenging. I was more op optimistic before he speaks. Uh, now I'm, I'm very much challenged. But what I will do uh, is to talk of the challenges Africa has in um, uh, uh, accessing or making available water resources uh, to our people. Um, also, uh, to bring sanitation services to them and uh, link it to the food because uh, I'm very much fan of the Nexus approach when you deal with water. And I think sometimes in the past, one of the issues uh, which uh, probably reduced the success uh, in water resources management was because we, we kept the silos and continued to manage every section uh, as a standalone thing. And uh, you can't conserve, conserve water if you can't get some benefit out of it. And you need uh, to gain, but make sure that that gain continues and uh, is left also to the generation to come. So my aspect will not be uh, to show how practical in terms of producing food or energy or other uh, 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 economic uh, uh, produces, but rather how we address the challenges we have as a council of ministers, as a, a, a continental body uh, dealing with this and advising the African Union, and also monitoring what countries are doing and reporting to the head of states a summit. And uh, then, of course, I will come back to the science because I'm talking to scientists. Um, yeah, it is no. And from Africa, uh, we, we say every time we refer, when we want to connect say, the humankind to water, we talk of, uh, we every time refer to the Nile, where uh, the whole civilization, which took more than uh, 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 actually millennia, was built on a stretch around the uh, Nile waters. And I think water and human development has been, have been linked for, for uh, uh, immemorial time. Uh, water is essential uh, not only for uh, human life uh, as per se as an individual body, but also for sanitation and for other services. Uh, it is a precondition, and uh, it is linked to food. You can't produce water without, I mean, food without water. You can produce food without soil, but not without water. And because of that, uh, all these water, uh, sanitation, and uh, food are uh, human rights, and uh, countries should be able to strive uh, to uh, providing them to people. 
And water is vital and um, a cornerstone to achieve sustainable development goals. And here we have been talking about poverty, inequalities. I think water is one of those factors which are one of the first manifestation of inequalities or poverty. And uh, uh, here we show how water links to everything we do in transport, in industry, in uh, tourism, and all those issues are linked to water. So water is indispensable, water cannot be uh, replaced. And uh, despite that, uh, we need to know that uh, we are dealing with a very essential uh, 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 substance, but which we, is also somehow rare, very scarce. Uh, when we look at uh, the maps, the, the earth is surrounded by a lot of, a lot of water, but 2% only of that water is fresh water, e uh, easily utilizable by, by people. And this is very uh, inequally distributed on the earth. You have very arid regions like uh, uh, in, in Africa, the deserts and, and so on. And Africa is one of uh, the continents which has that problem of scarcity of water despite the quantity of water we have uh, in the middle of the continent. So water is scarce globally uh, and uh, that pattern will continue to worsen as climate change impact uh, 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 acts or, 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 and, and the poorest are the most hit by that. We are talking of people who have no access to water. It is hundreds of million. Access to sanitation, hundreds of billion. I mean, billions, I rather. And uh, people who have not access to food, uh, enough food, or who are under severe uh, 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 food insecurity, it is hundreds of millions across the, the world. If we go to Africa, we need to uh, get this in mind, that Africa is the second driest country, I mean continent, with only 9% of the 2% of global uh, fresh water. And when we go down, we see that uh, we are already very much stressed with 40% who, uh, uh, who live in, in a scarce environment with less than 1,000 uh, uh, cubic meters uh, per, uh, per year, per capita. And the, all these are very challenging. In agriculture, we have a serious problem. Uh, the agriculture in, uh, in uh, Africa is still rain-fed. Uh, only 5% of the arable uh, uh, land is irrigated. And that brings very much down uh, the producti productivity and uh, makes the agriculture in Africa very vulnerable to uh, floods, to, um, uh, uh, to droughts. So, and that of course increases uh, the level of poverty you have with a continent where uh, most, uh, I mean more than 50%, uh, uh, it is 60 around uh, percent, are still uh, living in a rural area. Uh, to, to add to this, there is a lot of degradation because unlike what we have just seen for Brazil, we have a lot of soil degra de de degradation. Ecosystems are very much degraded and that comes to also pollute uh, the water resources and uh, compound the whole problem we have. Yeah, um, talking of groundwater, I mean uh, drinking water, we know that uh, uh, 340 million people are still fetching water and drinking water, raw water from the river. Uh, and those rivers, as I said, are very dirty. For sanitation, we have uh, acute problem, uh, same as uh, food insecurity in Africa. And uh, of course, sub-Saharan Africa is the most heat. Uh, when we talk of um, the causes of hunger, we will find it, and, and poverty in general, we will find it in so many uh, different causes and factors, like poverty itself, like conflict in so many areas. Um, for example, Somalia. So, for example, South Sudan. Uh, uh, currently, it is the most hit because of uh, of conflicts, environmental challenges, with uh, more desertification, 
with uh, droughts, with floods, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but also there are issues which are linked to governance. And this is where we find our anchorage with uh, all the issue of water management and development. Governance, policies, strategies, plans. And it links to capacity of doing all those things, not only political will. And um, the population growth, as you know, uh, Africa is one of uh, the continent, actually the continent with the highest uh, growth rate of the population. So what we need, uh, we need so many things, and we need uh, uh, to be determined. Yesterday, somebody talked about discipline. Uh, we uh, list down what we need and uh, be disciplined enough to have them uh, implemented. Uh, we need public investment in water for water security to be very high and very well sustained. And this is a serious issue we keep uh, talking about in, uh, at the African Union. Uh, but not much is done. As you know, uh, here in, in, in African Union, we have those decisions by the head of states, but we don't have enforcement mechanisms to ensure that every country uh, does what uh, is uh, promised. We have uh, inappropriate uh, governance uh, um, frameworks. Uh, the policies which are at country level, uh, some of them are very old not aligned with the current development, not aligned with the commitment our head of state are taking globally or at continental level. And that is something which uh, uh, calls upon AMCA or as a Council of Ministers to assist those countries and bring them up to the level of having a clear and uh, 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 po clear policies and policies with the, the, the requirements. We have so many countries we have been assisting, but currently we are developing a framework as, uh, 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 policy on sanitation, and later we'll go also to water and see how countries can very quickly be assisted, uh, supported to adapt them to their condition, and with the principle of flexibility in implementing the SDGs, then see first where the country is situated and how uh, those policies can be aligned to also the conditions of the countries. Um, yeah, when we talk of money and the finance required, it is billions, many billions. How do we get that, that money? We need innovative ways of financing uh, water and sanitation. And here we are not even talking of what is required in uh, changing the agriculture uh, 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 area. So we need a strong uh, enabling environment, policies. We need technical capacity and innovation and technologies we have been talking about here. And it is not yet enough, and enough adapted to the conditions and the need of our countries. And we need a strong political will and a determination to implement what is prioritized. And uh, the self-accountability is very important here. And uh, then develop strategic partnership not to come and implement those policies and bring us solutions. I think that has proven not to be sustainable, but rather partnership to come and augment the capacity we need and support us in doing what we have planned and then leave us the floor and so that we can continue and sustain the gain and build on them. I think it is a whole change of paradigm and mindset in our part and uh, then I think our partners can uh, very much uh, adapt to that. So I said the challenges are mainly on water, uh, big water, uh, drinking water, the pollution, the groundwater, which is almost not very well known. Uh, we need to develop the capacity uh, and uh, do research so that we can influence uh, the decision-making processes. And pollution, which is very high today, need to be capped so that uh, water can be used for different uses. On uh, food and energy, we have talked about uh, uh, the limited, very limited surface of land which is irrigated and uh, the low productivity. I think we need to do something, not only fertilizers, but also uh, the good technologies and uh, we can borrow a leaf from our brothers from this country. Africa in power. Again, we have resources like in Central Africa, 
but all the waters from, uh, for example, Inga, go down to the Atlantic Sea, it should be uh, utilized, and if it had been utilized, it would provide electricity for almost all the continent. I think that also is one of the issues we need to do in a country where you have those resources and only 3% is utilized. So climate change is knocking our door. How well are we prepared? Prediction. Last time I was uh, in uh, the office of Professor Koike, he is here. I was impressed with what is being done. And I know in Africa we still have a problem of doing those predictions, producing scenario like what you produce in NASA, in NASA, for example, and come up with decision support systems which will help us, will help our ministers base decisions on evidences. I think that is uh, one of the things. I will call upon the scientific community which is here to increase knowledge and use the knowledge for policies, for planning, and for influencing practice in uh, our countries. Um, we all agree that uh, unreliable access to water is the major cause of poverty. So water security should be one of the key priority Africa countries uh, should take so that uh, we can have enough water for all and for all users. We need to invest and uh, plan in a way to address all those issues. I talked of a Nexus approach, which need to be implemented and uh, in a proper way. And this planning uh, and having the capacity is very much uh, useful, necessary uh, to be done. And we have no time. I am almost, almost depressed when I talk about uh, the SDGs and realize that we have already spent almost four years and that in 11 years we need to change the world in a better place to live without poverty, without inequalities, without X and Y. No, I think we need to, uh, yes, discuss, enrich our knowledge, our strategies, learn from those who are making very big leapfrogs, but then, Act. Listen when we are acting. I think we need absolutely not to continue gathering information only, but we need to do something. And I'm saying it as an African because I think we are very much behind in terms of taking actions which are required uh, to do things. Now allow me to talk a bit of uh, AMCAO, but uh, very uh, short. The mission is to provide uh, political leadership policy direction and advocacy. And that is why we focus on uh, improving the policy landscape and also provide directions uh, through evidence-based uh, uh, mechanisms, like for example, by uh, doing the water and sanitation sector uh, monitoring and reporting uh, systems. And that is brought to uh, the leaders with clear recommendation on what is required so that we can influence their decision making by providing them data on what is taking place at the continental level. And um, the focus we have uh, taken uh, is um, uh, summarized on, on, in this flagship. We uh, have this monitoring system which produces information every two years in the report which are handed over uh, I mean, to, to our head of states uh, through the African Union. And I'm glad to report that this report has been utilized by the head of state indeed to take some decisions on initiatives which are currently being uh, implemented or worked on uh, to produce all the ingredients to have them implemented. I will start with the Kigali Action Plan. This was to address sanitation in the 10 countries that performed, performed the poorest on the MDGs. And uh, it brings them the means and capacity to help them change the situation. 2M, 4M initiative is, we uh, said the number of people who don't have access to clean water and sanitation. And if we take, for the period of the SDGs, we uh, serve two million on water and four million on sanitation every year, then we can 
uh, reach the objective. That is an initiative for which African Union and ourselves are mobilizing resources so that uh, we can be able to uh, fulfill it. Mobilizing resources it is not only from donors, but also discussing with the ministers of finance and having the uh, head of state again recommitting, as uh, they did in 2008 in Sharm Sheikh, to accelerate the Millennium Development Goals. And um, we also uh, have, from that report we produced, uh, the Water Resources Priority Action Program uh, Plan, which was uh, approved by all the uh, uh, countries of the continent, and uh, some projects have been uh, doing. And we have a number of other initiatives, like the Africa Water Week, which is a, a, a conference bringing together uh, all kinds of uh, players to exchange knowledge and um, um, uh, commit uh, to work together on water-related issues. Africa Sanitation Conference, which is also one of them. And then we have two trust funds, which are, uh, are operated by the African Development Bank to support countries develop projects and uh, uh, mobilize funds for infrastructure development. And uh, then for transboundary waters, we have the African Network of Basin Organization, and we are developing a program on groundwater so that we can support countries and also the Pan-African Water and Sanitation Knowledge Hub, which will provide the knowledge ready from one stop uh, center. Uh, we believe that uh, all these will contribute to um, improving uh, the uh, way countries are moving uh, forward. Other initiatives are like um, uh, producing uh, policies, as I said, but also we insist on capacity building. When I go to uh, areas and find some uh, capacities which can be uh, exported to Africa and uh, uh, build our own competencies, I try to build those uh, networks the same uh, as uh, the ministers who are in charge of managing uh, AMCA. But also, there is one uh, striking thing. Most of the initiatives and big programs are normally conceived by our friends from the north, from um, uh, different countries. And uh, we are recipient also of the definition of our own issues to be addressed. We think that it is time that we start gathering uh, the best brain we have on the continent, uh, analyze the situation, produce recommendations, and bring them to the head of states and other decision makers so that we can influence in a permanent, consistent way the decisions which are made on the continent and also the area uh, the investment are done. We need to continue strengthening this political will and we are currently working on provoking, causing another summit of head of state. And we are developing coordination and synergies as well as uh, a lot of partnership and resource mobilization for uh, more um, uh, uh, activities and infrastructure uh, development. Uh, this is the last uh, slide, I think, or uh, last but one. So here, I'm saying that uh, we, we, we are faced with, with challenges, but um, we need to change the mindset and the way we are addressing it. Learn from others and adapt uh, to uh, what is already available. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. With a change of mindset, with use of knowledge and technology and innovations, we can accelerate the, change, the changes we need. And uh, with that, I believe that we may not need to have absolutely the tens of years others went through to reach where they reach because we can learn from them and uh, a hand is given to us whenever we need to, ha to learn from them and cooperate with them. We need effective cooperation. We need to act now. And uh, I like this um, um, uh, uh, slide from uh, UN Waters which summarize all the factors necessary uh, to um, bring together the factors for sustainable development, for ending poverty, but also inequalities. We need drinking water. We need water for economic development. We need to preserve our capital, the ecosystems, and we need to be prepared to prepare our, ourselves and our economies to be resilient to climate change. For that, we need finance. 
We need peace and stability. We need political uh, determination. Uh, also, we need good governance and we need strong cooperation. I think if we put all those together, we can do the leapfrog our colleagues have been uh, talking about. I thank you very much for your attention. We are coming to the last talk of this session, which we'll give by Professor Zalewski. Professor Zalewski, as I said, is an eco-hydrologist and uh, operates a UNESCO institute in Poland. And he will report now on the integrations of sciences in a hydro-ecological way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to express my appreciation to Brazilian Academy of Science for inviting me for this very important and inspiring meeting. Uh, I would like to start from explanation why ecohydrology become one of the uh, one of become of the one of priorities of UNESCO International Hydrological Program for two reasons. First. There is a, putting together these two sciences, fill up the important gap which helps to manage water more probably, more, uh, more sustainable way. Second, the understanding interplay water biota generate opportunity to use ecosystem properties and processes as management tool, which are complementary to the recently used different solutions. Okay, I, I think the very important is to say first what wrong we are doing with water cycle in global scale. Water, this picture, what uh, globe during the night is not only showing fossil fuel use intensity in different parts of the world and different continents, but also showing in some area how we modify fundamental ecological cycle. Water cycling, carbon cycling, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And this is very important because this modification are certain border. It means we can easily cross port point no return if we go too far. And I will show how we eventually, by understanding this complicated interplays, we can go and reverse the process. This is especially important because recently ecological footprint is 1.7. It means in 1970 there was one. It means it was we use resources of global biosphere system in this rate, which was equal regenerative potential. 1.7. It means we are using much more intense, too intensive, and we have reversed now up to the one. And the young generation, that's your duty, is just to do it because time is limited according to different evaluations, we have a 30 years to really reverse the, the, the process of degradation of biosphere. And I think we have a quite optimistic messages during this uh, symposium. We had a very positive example from Brazil that we can build what I'm calling engineering harmony between man, environment, and build up the sustainable future this way. We also had some very important uh, information how to modern technologies can be supportive. However, the dangerous element is just that at recent stage, as Ogburn said, legal system uh, politics in the range non-material values, moral beliefs change much slower than economic processes. Business is fast. 
And that's why academies has to accelerate transfer of progress in science into solving problem of sustainability. And what, we, what wrong we are doing with hydrological cycle? First of all, we accelerate water outflow from the oceans. In the moment when we have a progress in the climatic processes, this is not very wise. So, second, we are just, by reducing retentiveness of the water, we're degrading the soil in the globe. Brazil is positive example that we sometimes can reverse this by using uh, modern biotechnologies, but still the map is just a very important warning because restoration of soil is long process. And also recently in many countries in the world there is about 10% for decade reduction of organic matter in the soil, which is very, very bad. And especially in the face of climatic change, which this tension will be increasing. So, what are also typical practices is one of the pictures from Europe and there's sometimes policy is not very wise. In Europe we have a very, very positive action by, initiated by European Commission but while this one is not very good because farmers are getting money proportionally to the surface cultivated land. In this moment they are destroying land water ecotons when Brazil has to be proportional to the width of the river, as we have seen. And also, as you see, to make very comfortable tractors drivers, they destroy the uh, tree rows in the landscape which reduce wind speed. And acceleration wind speed, you see, it was uh, 20 years before this picture, there was lots of patchiness of landscape, low, lots of tree rows when there was so-called modern agriculture, open space, in 20 years, the organic matter was lost from the upper part of the field. And on the sand, we cannot compensate only by artificial fertilizer. Restoration is very, very long. I think here is a, one element that land water ecotons, pardon, land water ecotons are destroyed, and we have a fluxes of fertilizers and uh, also organic matter to the small stream which is providing this to reservoirs and to also to the sea. This is process which appears everywhere. This is from picture from my program in Tanganyika Lake, the Ruzizi River. And of course, transfer nutrients generate algal bloom in reservoir lakes when they are coming and converted in this very dangerous, toxic uh, substances. How did the situation looks with uh, geophysical processes? Climate change in, on the right side in the Varta River. Poland, green is terrestrial phase. We put three elements, atmospheric water vapor deficit, wind speed, solar radiation balance, and you can see that these three para parameters which are characteristic for climate change defin defining precisely, the potential evaporation can increase from 600 millimeters to almost 1,000. It is a real situation. Eh? And in Poland, we have a precipitation 550 millimeters. So this is potential evaporation. It means every small precipitation immediately will be escaping to the atmosphere, just especially in this open landscape. So complexity of landscapes is first condition to really increase retentiveness of the water. Second, if we increase drought area, you can see the river flow, Varta river flow, declined from, by half almost. So if land become dry, there is no motor in river. So building reservoirs will be not, at this moment, not recompensation of this process. So that's why, how, let's look how in Africa it looks. This is data from Ethiopia. We just analyzed the process of deforestation in the, one of the rivers, Tana Lake. And you can see that again, by during only 30 years, the atmospheric water vapor demand increased also very significantly, almost 60%. And what is interesting, the river outflow also increase. Somebody can say, oh, this case is optimistic. No, because 
simply if the deforestation appear, up, evaporation appear, faster flow to the river appear and erosion appear and process filling up reservoir with uh, sediments uh, accelerate unbelievably. So beside land become very dry, this water escaped two ways. So as you see the complexity interaction is just very high and we have to take into consideration. Um, so now, okay, when I was make very brief introduction, the problems which are getting more and more important, science. As I said, the recent phase of AHP, ecohydrology, engineering harmony for sustainable world, world, I especially use the word engineering because lots of people who are involved in ecology, they are trying like a, in contradiction to engineers. I'm saying no. Without cooperation with engineering, we have no chance to find a sustainable way. <clears throat> and, of course, ecohydrology is the use relationship between ecosystem and the water as tool for catchment management. And everything starts from this model a long, long time ago, when the integration of the ecological and hydrological processes was proposed. <clears throat> the well, axis stream order is just a, a reference point to Bernoulli law because Bernoulli law is determining turbulent flow and expenditure energy and survival organism depends how energy gain, energy expenditure. That's why in Channel A's river we don't have a fish because too much energy gain is not compensated by food supply. And temperature, thermodynamics law determine the all metabolic processes, Michaelis curve, enzymatic activity, and uh, uh, all the Krog curve explaining the, the metabolic rate and so on. So in this moment, we, this model allowed to predict that in small boreal stream, you have completely abiotic regulation. And when was used by FAO as framework to the program habitat modification freshwater up, uh, fisheries, it appears that stocking Small salmon to the, the small stream in Norway has nonsense. It's necessary to modify habitats, abiotic factors, reduce the Bernoulli law, turbulent flow, and make some resting area when the fish can save energy and so on. And this worked very well. And for, so next step, there was next used also, also a certain framework to ecohydrology program. This model was tested. Uh, by uh, statistical method, by my uh, one of my former PhD, and it's appeared that very nicely confirmed that hydrological regulation is always during when hydrology is dynamic, when hydrology is stable and predictable, bio biological interaction uh, start to manifest themselves, and of course. The model was also inspired by debated 70s density dependent, density dependent regulation because he combined and explained both. How it was translated to problem solving, because I said ecohydrology problem solving science. Uh, we uh, this, we in, in, the discovered that algal bloom intensity depends in Sulev reservoir on phosphorus concentration, which is obvious. However, when we regulate water level during the spawning period and we reduce the number of fish fry, in this moment zooplankton explode and phosphorus was not converted into toxic algal bloom. And here you see only by understanding feedback between hydrology and biological processes, we reduce from the model predicted 15 milligram bloom to seven. So it's a very important supportive tool and of course it's uh, equivalent of reduction of phosphorus from 200, over 200 to 140 micrograms. This will be very costly if we don't, uh, we, we try to apply this. <coughs> A second model catchment, as I said catchment management, this was published in, in Brazilian Journal of Biology, this model. And a very simple relation appeared that amount of carbon accumulated by the ecosystem is dependent of amount of water. So if we evaporate the water and we send to the sea the water, 
ecosystem cannot accumulate the carbon. In this, in this moment, has no potential to provide productivity and generate biodiversity. However, temperature changed the allocation of carbon. In the low temperatures, the bottom uh, place, all the carbon is, uh, in, uh, as Alaska, accumulated in dead organic matter, not too much in biomass, because the composition ratio is 40 years. So if the needle drop out, 40 years takes to release atom of phosphorus to be taken again by plant. In Cameroon jungle, on the left side up, there is one year. It's the rate of recirculation. That's why our systems are much more vulnerable to the climate change, and that's why we have to manage much, much more carefully and use some biotechnology which was developed in Brazil, like, for example, soya, uh, enhanced by microbial activity to be able to trap the nitrogen and in this moment increase the, the nit nitrogen pool. As I said, the framework in ecohydrology is a catchment. Why? Because catchment, not ecosystem, because in catchment we can very precisely quantify hydrological cycle. We can know how much water can, how much evaporate, how can is recharge groundwater and so on. And that's why it's much more for management, much better framework than this. And this is mathematical model of catchment when on the, we analyze the impact. Red area is showing uh, where the area when the big nitrogen fluxes are coming to the river. And in this moment, we don't need to use some technologies everywhere, only according to identification of area of the threats. So in this moment, it's worth to underline the hydrology is covering certain gap. In natural, if we see the gradient of the impact expressed as nutrient, nutrient concentration, the natural system has, uh, for example, in Europe, 30 micrograms uh, concentration of phosphorus streams in the biosphere reserve like forest. Ecosystem resilience can be three times more. It's still not showing any toxic algal bloom. However, the technology are just CO2 treatment plan reduced from, two to two, from 10 to 2, to 1 milligrams. And the ecosystem is definitely too much. And just ecohydrology proposed the solution to cover this gap. And why this is important? Because I, when I was asking my friend, engineer, why are you not building sewage treatment plant which reduced from 10 to 0, 1, he said, you know, very simple. Cost of treatment plant which is reducing from 10 to 1 is a half what will be from 10 to 0, 1. And in this moment, using ecohydrological eco biotechnology is order of magnitude uh, cheaper than, than use this uh, techn technical things. How to apply? Because this uh, often when I'm as UNESCO expert traveling in the world, the uh, question is, okay, we have a problem in this reservoir. I'm saying, show me the map of catchment. <laughs> no, the reservoir. <laughs> so that's why always catchment. First, hydrologic quantification. Second, ecosystem distribution, pristine, but also those ones who has to be somehow restored and nature-based solution, some solution. Uh, why biotechnology? Provide knowledge how to convert forms matter to improving water quality. Uh, in this, we develop lots of, let's say, molecular biology application for this type of the solution. Uh, we use also, as a first step, enhancement of resilience natural ecosystem, like this flat plain was absorbing 250 kilograms, but by uh, putting some bioenergy plantation, we increase, depends on scenario, almost doubling. And kilograms, maybe not too much, but one kilogram is converted to one, two tons of algal, toxic algal blooms if it's coming to the reservoir. And here, the, another type of technologies, uh, nitrogen identification barrier or geochemical barrier for settlements, which are composed in the landscape. You can, it can be used like, uh, like a path along the coast. And this is type of the development which are protecting from monsoon pollution, which are, yeah, 
But one of the most important issues is reservoir building. And I was asked to evaluate if this reservoir, which a small town would like to build for recreation, will be blooming. I said yes after analysis, toxical algal bloom, I guarantee. However, I can tell you how to build to avoid algal blooms. And there was simply like this. We still leave beautiful meandering wild river with otter, beavers, and so on. River exists and we put the reservoir on the side, besides special system which is measuring water quality and releasing all the stages of pure water, dilution stages into the reservoir, and when high phosphorus is coming, and of course the river is pulsing all the time, it's going through the wild river, phosphorus is not toxic for the fish. And this is idea that uh, in ecohydrology that you have any type of the measures enhance five elements. <laughs> this is something similar. Water has to be improved. Biodiversity has to be improved, and no doubt this solution will improve. Ecosystem services for society. Here is a recreational area and education center. Resilience to climate change. Of course, when we build such reservoir, groundwater level will be lifted up and, and wetlands will recover, and also will be refuge during a drought period. And finally, Culture education. Here is a center of education designed to, to teach them how to. You know. Very briefly about the city of the future. This is a city also, it's not very healthy. If there's no water, no green, this is asthma allergy. Green is area when you have some water, some um, this. And that's why in ecohydrology we propose a different ap approach. Bottom up, it means the system is. Uh, for, built from infrastructure, but in hydrology we are saying we need a man on the top, health and quality of life, and concept blue-green network, develop some biotechnology to clean up store water and retain them in the city landscape, make some pathways for physical activity. And this is a real story. Such the, the reservoir in the city looks like this, and we develop some technologies. Here, here is a sequential biofiltration system, you see efficiency on the beginning, the water which is very dirty, suspended matter on the end of the system and after crossing is like mountain stream. Most important that highest concentration are reduced very efficiently because very often system is not reacting, reservoir below. Another project, recreation in the forest develops some hybrid system combining the engineering with biotechnological and just from this, you can, we convert system like this. This is a hybrid constructions, different. And this was prized best of the best European Commission among 60 pro pro projects in Brussels last May. And now more advanced solution already for, for protecting the lake. Uh, this is for improving the small efficiency uh, sewage treatment plant. Efficiency is coming to 90, over 90% 90 and 70% phosphorus. And systemic solution, Ethiopia case. I just, just for you, this is the director of the Eco African Ecohydrology Center. We're just discussing some issue. Of course, we use some molecular biology to identification the threats, algal bloom, toxic strains of algae, and some development. This is, was adaptation to Africa, what you suggest, system which we use to purify stormwater in the city. And here the people couldn't drink the uh, water because there was lots of dioxin, toxic algal bloom. Uh, this was center of farmers' education in this. And we show that if the sediments are used and mix also keep that cows on the side watering, not in the stream. So you achieve such cabbage. If you only use sediments, you can achieve this. And if you have a just ground, it's like this. So I think it's very important in Africa, especially to show people how it really works. Immediately they follow and going further with this. And Okay, now education. All this is possible when we are talking with stakeholders, with decision makers. 
It was a process which needs uh, some, let's say, uh, involvement of society, and all of this we need to put together different disciplines of science, because only they, they, this way to generate innovation, and most important is this, how we should teach the people. And I think in Brazil there was a problem that you put lots of money for education and there was no improvement in the economy. And probably from my observation that if we increase number of information, it's not enough. It's necessary to translate into knowledge, theory of understanding pattern processes, and next also uh, So, we have another 20 minutes left for questions. And we, again, we collect three questions and then we... Oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Luis. Thank you for the exciting talks. Uh, uh, I have a question which uh, I think is, uh, I mean, is related to the first and the third talk, actually. But, uh, you know, you both mentioned biodiversity uh, and it's indeed true that uh, in the region shown by Mauricio uh, this uh, tropical region that's a region which is rich in biodiversity you know, one believes and Mauricio can maybe correct me on that that Brazil has 20 percent of the world biodiversity uh, uh, and we know about five percent of that or maybe less uh. Now, of course, you, you mentioned biotechnology as a means of uh, helping, you know, all these problems that you mentioned. But then there is this uh, fantastic use of biotechnology for medicines. And what's happening in Brazil and in other countries is that we buy medicine produced by companies abroad uh, with very high prices medicine that is based, say, on Brazilian biodiversity. Uh, you know, from Amazon comes a substance called bergenin, has a strong anti-inflammatory power. It's sold in Brazil by about, what, $250 the milligram. That's 10,000 times more expensive than gold. Uh, so, uh, isn't... Uh, isn't it, it interesting actually to actually fight against inequality between countries to uh, strongly develop uh, biotechnology, startups, and so forth, based on this fantastic biodiversity? Well, that's the, the new point. Second question. Any other question? Maybe I will clarify on now or, no, or later. After. But if not, we, yeah, okay. It's a, a related question. So the last presentation emphasized the importance of using the catchment to manage any hydro hydrological system. And yet, possibly around the world, but very certainly in Africa, um, rivers have often formed the boundaries that were drawn by the colonial powers or alternatively, they simply drew lines which didn't take into account any geographical or um, ethnic issues as well. And so in Africa, and I would ask for a response also from the colleague from the AU, um, managing catchments become very difficult or become very difficult frequently because the catchment is owned by two different countries or at the very least. Um, and so comments on both, how, how do we go about catchment management when geopolitical boundaries cross over such catchment areas? Any 
Hello. Thank you very much. I, um, I very much enjoyed uh, these uh, three presentations. Uh, but I have a short question to uh, Canisius. Um, I think you made a very strong case um, uh, on um, the importance of African leaders in the African Union, and in this case, of course, uh, AMCO itself, to get the right, the right science advice. And uh, you mentioned an Africa think tank, that is homegrown think tank, to do this. Um, what have you done about this? Have you, for example, consulted the academies of science in Africa uh, or the network of African academies in Africa? And this is a very powerful network of academies for the African Academy of Sciences. So I want to know where you are seeking such think tank advice. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, it, it is an idea w which is still being nurtured. Eh? Uh, we, we have universities, we have academies, we have uh, centers of excellence, uh, which are, are, are water centers of excellence, which are, which are very much uh, linked to uh, uh, AMCAO and uh, feeds uh, some information and knowledge which can be used for this. But uh, we believe that there are so many people, most of them who are no longer active in, in different positions, who have retired and uh, who have a lot of mountains of knowledge they can share with, with the generation. And of course, you have young people who have the things they can contribute. We thought that um, we at uh, African Union, at AMCA, we can put a list of, of questions uh, prioritized. And we have not a permanent uh, think, think tank as an institution, but rather uh, prominent African scientists in specific areas who uh, could meet a number of times, uh, uh, analyze the situation, produce recommendations, and uh, give us those recommendations uh, to be put in the pipeline of African Union uh, so that we can uh, uh, have new ideas uh, fertilizing the thinking which take place at uh, African Union. Most of the time, they stay in the same uh, type of environment. They have very rarely uh, some new thinking which sometimes can be provocative. We need not to let them remain in that comfort zone. We need some time to take them out of the box and uh, have those ideas. So. I took uh, personally some time to reflect on that. I sold the ideas last year to uh, the Swedish uh, cooperation because I needed fund to start that kind of ideas. And currently I'm developing the, a concept note which will be shared with, with, with a few and then we will start. I think the first uh, meeting of that kind will take place in this year 2019. But if you allow me, I can uh, also talk a bit about the catchment. <laughs> Uh, just very quickly, uh, oh, because he referred to Africa. We, we have uh, this African network or basin uh, organization. We have many transboundary institutions dealing with this. And one of the things we have tried to promote as much as possible is that riparians should be able to work together to protect the basin, the, the, the catchment, to protect the, the river itself, I, I, itself and think together to invest what it requires, but also think of a mechanism to share the benefits. So we come now to the question of the economics of biodiversity. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor, for this uh, <clears throat> very important question. Uh, in fact, uh, Brazil is at the top uh, of the list of uh, mega diverse countries, uh, the, uh, among the 17 mega diverse countries, Brazil is uh, the first one. We have uh, a huge uh, biological diversity in our country. It's really hard to attrib attribute a number on that. There are several estimates uh, to things that uh, for which we have metrics like plants, animals, but you think about microorganisms in a tropical country, it's impossible 
to measure. We don't even have metrics uh, to really grasp what is the extent of this uh, diversity. Uh, I don't know much about uh, medicine. I know that many companies are exploring the, the potential of uh, uh, biodiversity as source of uh, medicines, as a source of information to develop synthetic uh, uh, chemicals and so. But I, I can speak for agriculture. I think agriculture is the sector that is really uh, giving good examples on how to use uh, biological diversity. I gave an example here, which uh, is uh, uh, the, the selection of rhizobia in adapted to tropical soils that are helping Brazil to, uh, to save $13 billion every year in chemical fertilizers. We have the example of acai, which is, a, you probably know, this uh, fruit, uh, palm tree from the Amazon that uh, has been explored. It gives us an opportunity to use the forest without cutting the forest because this palm can live below the trees. It's uh, tolerant to shading and, and so on. But I think uh, the best way to think about uh, the use of biodiversity is through this, say, emerging concept of a new economy, uh, bioeconomy. There is a new uh, concept uh, emerging as a way to help us move from the old economy, which is tremendously dependent on uh, not clean processes, a lot, a lot of dependency on uh, uh, non-renewable sources like petroleum, uh, so there is this concept of a circular economy or <clears throat> a bio-based economy, which I think will open new avenues for us to look at this uh, huge uh, uh, wealth uh, that uh, tropical countries have and uh, to really uh, uh, devise uh, new ways, new value chains, new products, and so on and so forth. I think this, there is uh, the potential. I think what uh, industry has done up to now with uh, uh, biodiversity is just the very tip of an iceberg. You, you, you think about this new emerging area of uh, microbiome. We are learning now that we uh, humans are uh, uh, very complex ecologies. We are made up of 30 trillion cells and there are 40 trillion cells living on us. And it's the same in plants, it's the same in animals. So microbiome is another uh, area, another emerging field of innovation that I think will open up uh, immense uh, avenues for uh, development of uh, uh, biodiversity. And maybe a good thing for uh, the, the academy to, to think about, to raise the, the debate and the discussion in Brazil about the agenda of Brazil for bioeconomy. It makes all sense for a country that is at the top of the list of mega diverse countries to have a very strong agenda for the development of uh, the new economy, the bioeconomy. Yeah, thank you. I think I would like to say a few words about this ecosystem biotechnologies. In ecohydrology, we expand the understanding what is uh, biotechnology, because usually biotechnology was related to medicine, to industry, pharmaceutical industry, food industry. But in reality, definition of biotechnology is conversion of form of matter using organism. And that's why, generally, we reduce amount of carbon in the biomass in the landscape, into mineral form. So now, biotechnology is also expanded to different type of measures which we are using for modification form of matters, yeah? like acceleration mineralization in some processes or conversion of the nutrients which are tra traveling across the landscape into the biomass of plants, buffering zone and so on. So this is also ecosystem biotechnology or and in situation when we're using dual regulation water biotech or hydrological biotechnologies. We are 20 minutes behind time. We started 20 minutes below. I get the sign from uh, Marcus that he should uh, break here, have a coffee break, and then we we'll continue with the next session in a half an hour. Thank you very much.